Hi, everyone. Welcome to Snarky with Mike Feeney. I'm your host, Boston George. That's me now. Just like Boston George Young, the guy from Blow who sold all those drugs. I am now, I might be a Boston guy, but we'll get into that in a second. Thank you very much for watching the show, for being here, for subscribing, for leaving a review. You're all great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm excited to be back. Have had myself a hell of a morning, but guess what? It's all good now because we're sitting here. We got drinks in hand. Nicole's on the ones and twos. Nicole, how are you feeling? I'm good. We made it. We made it. My God, we made it. And what are we drinking? This is a new cocktail. New cocktail alert. <laughs> That's going to be a fun thing we can do. It's a new cocktail alert um, on Snarky. This first ever... I'm not even fully sure all the ingredients because uh, Erica, it's Erica's recipe. But we got, at its base, we got vodka. We got muddled fresh watermelon. We got lime juice, agave, a little bit of Grand Marnier. And uh, I think that's it. And then you shake and you enjoy. And I got to tell you, this drink is not only healing me, but it is... I mean, one of the more delicious things I feel like I've had in recent memory. You know, here's what it is. It's the fresh watermelon. If this was watermelon juice or syrup, it would be disgusting. And Nicole has said that she doesn't think she's ever had a watermelon drink before. I don't think I ever have, unless it was maybe like in slushy form. Mm, but now this is the first drink of the rest of your life, because how good does this taste? It's so good, and it tastes only like watermelon, which is good and bad. Like, it's, it's so refreshing. Scary. I know. I'm, I was ready to put like four extra shots in this, because I'm like, I don't feel like I tasted enough. But um, we'll see. By the end of this, I got a feeling I'll, I'll say something regrettable. So have a lot to get into. Can't wait to talk about Boston. I'll, I'll do that in a sec. But I want to start out with a fun little thing that happened to Erica and I. We were going to see that movie, Licorice Pizza. Have you seen that yet, Nicole? No, I haven't. It's the new uh, Paul Thomas Anderson film. It's fun. You know, it's like... Uh, it's a... Uh, you know what that movie is? It's, it's the swings at a carnival. You know, where it's that swing ride where you with the chain thing and it just spins around. And, you know, you're never excited about it. And then when you're on it, you're like, oh, OK, this is nice. This is fun. And then once you get off it, you're like, I'm I, that was, you know, I'm glad I did it. But like, I'm not rushing to get back on the swings. You know what I mean? Like, it's, that's how I would describe the movie. It, it was good. I'd recommend seeing it. It's cute. It's a nice little like love story. But at the same time, you're like. I don't know. Like, it's not as memorable as his other movies, for sure. But that doesn't matter. Uh, here's what matters, is that the movie was going out of theaters soon. So I was like, we got to go see it. So we had two choices of theaters to go to. We had a choice to go to uh, Kipps Bay, which is on the east side, which is the one that Eric and I usually always go to. We love that one. It's got the reclining leather seats and stuff. Or Lincoln Center. And Lincoln Center is like the big, one of the biggest movie theaters in New York City. And it's they always have giant IMAX theater screens. It's, it's like four floors. It's crazy. So sometimes when you want to see like a big scope movie, you want to go to Lincoln Center because they probably have better whatever thing, whatever. So we go to that one, which is all the way on the west side. We get there. The theater is not stadium seating, which at first it's like, how do you have a movie theater in 2022 and not have it stadium seating? Like, Fix it, you know, like absolutely just fix it, you know, make it. This was just flat, like we were sitting in a classroom or something, like it was just flat. So everybody's head is in everybody. Else. You have to like look in between two shoulders in order to see the goddamn thing. There's no recliners, they only have like the rockers. And we are in the middle of the row because we were like, oh, we'll situate ourselves in the middle. But there's like six people on either side of us, which proved to be quite a disaster in the very near future. So we were sitting there in this movie theater. It's a two and a half hour movie, right? So you're like, I already, I don't like being locked in to the middle. I don't like, I'm like, I can't get up and ask six people to get up and then six people to get up again when I come back. So I am, uh, we're watching this movie and like two rows, two or three rows behind us, there is a person who has, I mean, just, a terrible, terrible laugh. Just, just one that is so, and, and I tried to really capture it in my memory to, to give it to you guys. And the closest I can get is like, <laughs> like it was like a, it was, it was staccato, like, <laughs> like a very sharp, 
every second is its own little moment thing. Like that was the kind of thing. And it was distracting. Like most of the people kept like craning to see who was doing it and why and, you know, and, and why they were even laughing so hard at, at a moment when which someone gets cancer, you know. So that's its own thing. So we're, you know, we're, we're watching the movie. That's a little bit distracting, but we're like, okay. Then there's people directly behind us and they are just, you know, given the commentary on the entire film, just like, oh, I like that scene. Oh, that scene's pretty good too. Oh, what did you think about this? And then, no, there's no way he's not going to do that, is he? Oh, what a fucking idiot, this guy. Just doing that the entire time. And I, you know, the sign felt that I gave him the half turn, you know? What else can you do, you know? What else, besides just the, <clears throat> you know, that kind of a thing. But I'll tell you what else you can do. You could be an old Jewish woman. Because if you're an old Jewish woman, societal norms don't apply to you because there was an old Jewish woman and her husband sitting uh, two seats next to Erica and I. And Lincoln Center is, in that whole area, that movie theater typically attracts a ton of like, Upper West Side's a lot of older Jewish people. It is a very older Jewish theater clientele in that place. So needless to say, they weren't too happy by the young bucks talking behind us. And uh, this old Jewish woman, literally in the middle of the movie, turns and goes shh like the longest most obnoxious shush i've ever heard in my life that was by the way so much more distracting than the murmuring behind us you know it was like the entire theater was like what the fuck was that like just a a five second long shush right so you go well that's crazy and who does that but like, I get it, she's old, she's got six days left on this planet, let her fucking watch Licorice Pizza, you know? So then you think, well, surely that's enough from the old Jewish woman, but she decides to double down. What is the only thing more obnoxious than a loud long shush in a movie theater, do you think, Nicole? I really can't think of anything worse than that. Well, I'll tell you, and this is what she did, she took out her phone and put on the flashlight and went like this and was waving it in the pitch black theater at the people behind us while double shush, shush like this, waving it as if she was trying to signal down a plane on a deserted island. That's how crazy this woman was to the point where Erica and I just started hysterically laughing because I've never seen a level of obnoxious while also like thinking that you're doing the right thing by like being like, listen, everyone should be quiet in this theater. Meanwhile, she is fucking, she looks like a new nightclub opening with the spotlights going all over the place. She's just doing this screaming shush. It just the most Jewish. It was so funny to watch Eric and I couldn't stop laughing for half the movie. And then meanwhile, then the other guy starts laughing in the back from the flashlight. He's going, <laughs> and that kind of, it was just, it was a nightmare. The whole thing was a nightmare. Maybe that's why I didn't enjoy the movie as much as I could have. And so like two hours in, mind you, it's a two and a half hour movie. Erica has to pee so bad, like so bad. And she's like, but you could feel the movie coming to its close. So she's just kind of like holding it. She's just doubled over. She's, the legs are crossed. And now it's like the last 15 minutes of the movie. and she's like sweating. It, she's turned into me at the Buble show. And I gotta tell you, when the shoe's on the other foot, boy, I get why you guys didn't care as much as I cared because I'm sitting there going, I know that feeling, that really sucks. But, you know, movie's still on, so what do you, I mean, you could leave, but you know you're gonna miss the last scene. So she holds out, the movie ends, like literally it cuts to black, says like, directed by Paul Thomas Anderson. I don't even think the house lights have come up yet. Erica has her coat on, zipped up. She starts like rushing out of the aisle. She's doubled over in pain. The old two Jewish people are upset because they have to get up. So they like, you know, make a hole like, <sighs> and like, you know, and they stand up and get out of her way. I'm not ready to leave the aisle yet. I'm still like gathering my belongings and like putting things together. I told her I'd meet her out there, right? And I assumed obviously the Jewish people were gonna get up and they were gonna leave the theater. They weren't going to sit there I sit back down and, you know, establish, you know, a fucking base camp in these in this aisle. So she, you know, she runs through. They both sit back down. And by the time they both sit down and like relax again, the credits are on, the house lights come up and now I'm ready to get out. And so I start moving towards the aisle and the old um, the old Jewish man 
goes, I, he says to his Jewish wife, who they for sure don't realize how loud they're talking, or maybe they do, and they're, again, just doing the most Jewish thing ever of, like, the New York Jew. And he goes, I just got up for her. I am not getting up again. And it's what he just said. It was like, yeah, the movie's over. Like, I'd like to leave now. Like, what are we doing, you know? But I was already so miffed by the fact of the, the shushing and the flashlight thing that I just said out loud to them. I went, oh, okay. And then I just blasted through their legs. I mean, I just, just knee to knee clomped them and just, you know, and they, it was like, I hit his left knee, which hit into his right knee, which hit into her left knee, which hit into her, it was like a xylophone, like, like that kind of a thing. Terrible xylophone impression, but you get it. And it just ding, 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 just knocked all of their knees, blasted them. They screamed in pain. I walked right past them, walked out of the theater, never to return to that theater ever again. But I mean, who says, who's just as with a flashlight? Who says I'm not getting up? And then, and then doesn't at least tuck their knees in for the other person to get out. Am I, am I crazy, Nicole? I was on their side until the very end because mm. the shushing in the flashlight is how I feel inside, but I will never like have the balls to do that. Yeah, I, I respected that in like a, I can't believe you just did that kind of a way. But yeah, but the but the other part, I mean, come on, right? Yeah, the not standing up is crazy and then saying it out loud and forcing you to just pile drive through them is oh, crazy. Man, I felt like a kneecap turned to dust upon, upon, Assault. <laughs> so, you know, that was Licorice Pizza. Go check it out, I guess, you know, um, if you could find it. Uh, so I go to Boston and I have, boy, oh boy, what a, what a little weekend that turned out to be. Un, unplanned, whoops, unplanned to us. Mike and I, Mike Ken and I both scheduled dates in Boston one day apart. So I'm going up on Thursday. He's at this other place, uh, this other venue on Friday and Saturday. I go up to Laugh Boston. I take the Accela, which I've never taken an Accela in my life. And I don't even think I've ever taken an Amtrak in my life. But I was on an Accela. And I got to say, um, it's maybe the greatest thing ever. I don't know. Have you ever been on an Accela train before, Nicole? I have, yeah. they Probably the exact same route as you, too, going to Boston. I mean, it is... Is there anything better? I, it is just so painless, so relaxing, so beautiful. I mean, I'm sitting there in the, uh, in like the business. I got the business. I didn't get first class, but I got the business one. And so this was a little weird, though. I get, I get to the train. I'm at Penn Station. I go to get on it. And, um, you know, it train doesn't look like it's going to be that full. And there's a woman, you know, young, probably in her 20s, sitting in the seat next to mine. And she has all of her stuff on my seat. So I'm looking around and like the car is more than half empty. So I'm like, all right, I don't want to. I'm that window seat. I don't want to like go in there and have someone next to me if I don't necessarily have to have someone next to me. So I sit, I put my stuff behind her. I take an open seat and I go, hey, just want to let you know, like, I'm supposed to be in that seat there, but I'm just going to sit in this seat and see if anybody comes. And then we can both not have to share seats with somebody, you know, and see if it stays open. Great guy on my part, right? Just just a great, terrific, thoughtful human being. She goes, great. Then someone comes and they are sitting in the seat that I sat in. So I go, all right, well, if that's the case, I'm going to go sit back in my old seat. So I go and I go, hey, sorry, the, the guy ended up coming. So I'm going to go back in my seat. So she goes, oh, OK. She takes all of her stuff, picks it all up and leaves the train car. She was never even supposed to be in that seat. She was doing to me what I thought I was being thoughtful doing for her, which is trying to find an open seat. And that way we don't have to share a seat. Meanwhile, she was blasted out of somebody else's seat that she was going to have to share and tried to take my seat. But what a weird move on her part to not be like when I walked up being like, oh, I'm actually not supposed to sit here. I'll go take one of the other open seats. Like, is that, isn't that weird, Nicole? That's so funny too. She probably just didn't know where she was because that's happened to me before my first time riding the Amtrak. I entered business class because it's like the back of the train or something. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the routes that has like Super nice, like leather seats that recline and curtains yeah. that you can draw over the window. And yeah. I remember texting my parents and I was like, I can't believe people don't do this all the time. Like, this is the best way to travel. 
like reclined with like a McChicken or whatever I brought with me <laughs> for my ride, just like completely yeah. degenerate. Yeah. Yeah. And they were like, are you in business class? I was like, oh, fuck. Like, I definitely am. And I like sprinted into a different car. But but this woman, the second I was like, oh, I got to be she like catapulted out of the seat like she knew she knew what she was doing. I like that you gave her the benefit of the doubt, but it was not the case. She was caught right hand and she could have just been like, no, I'm actually supposed to. Like I'm the aisle seat. I don't know. So so she ends up leaving the whole rest of the the whole trip. I got I got the seat next to me completely open. I'm fucking watching the snowfall as I'm reading a, a book, drinking a nice coffee. I mean, life is so good. I, I'm loving life. I get to Boston painless three hours flat. And now I'm like, I want to go. I, I have a bunch of food and drink places that I want to go to this weekend. So I'm like, trying to cross them off the list. So I, I plan the closest one to the train station is this place, Sam Lagrasse's, which is um, a seven minute Uber from the train station. And I get there um, nine minutes before they close. So I immediately was like, I don't know if this is one of those businesses where like in the last 10 minutes, they kind of lock the doors and just help the people who are still in there. So I go, fuck it, I'm gonna chance it. I get a lift. I get into the back of it. I tell the guy, I got to be there in under nine minutes. And this dude just goes on two wheels. He's careening around corners. There's like children, like mothers pushing their children in strollers. And then they like jump out of the way. We blast the stroller. The baby goes flying. We keep going. And she, you know, he does a fucking drift into the right outside of the building. And I just roll out of the car at 30. And um, I get there at, it closed at two. I got there at 1.59 p.m., last customer of the day. Um, I order what is, go, will go down as one of the top three best Rubens I've ever had in my entire life. Holy shit. I'm gonna include the video in this, so Nicole, you can put it right there, of me just sensually, sensually eating this Ruben, which made me, I've never had a reaction where I ate something so good it made me mad. Like I literally, it was a chameleon plan. I started cursing. I was like, fuck you. Uh, are you fucking kidding me? Like I, I was mad at the sandwich purveyor for keeping this from me. And and also for setting the bar of how good a Reuben could taste that high. It was it was perfect. So I, I eat that. Now I'm happy as a little clam. I go over, I walk to this awesome coffee shop. I go down to my, uh, I go to my hotel. I, I check into the hotel. And the hotel was so cool. This place is like, it's gorgeous. It's on the waterfront. It's, it's in the, like, the seaport district down there. So nice. I go to check into this hotel and I use some of my little business tactics, Nicole. My little negotiating masterclass that I've watched about how to negotiate in business. And here's the thing. I got to be checked out Friday at 11 a.m. Mike and Nicole and Brendan are coming up to Boston. They are perpetually running late to every, there's no shot that they are going to be in Boston by even noon. You know, it's more likely three or 4 p.m. So what am I going to do? It's it, it actually, the day, Thursday when I got there was actually very nice. It was like 30, 40 degrees, but Friday was going to be zero degrees outside. So I'm like, I'm not just walking around Boston in zero degree weather. This is crazy. So I go, this is, this is the trick they teach you in this, in this master class, which I'll give to you guys, even though you're not paying the, the annual fee, um, is that the woman checks me in. She goes, is there anything else I can do? And I said, yes, I'm very sorry. I'm going to, I'm going to make your life terrible. Like I got a huge, I like, this is, I'm going to really put you out. I'm going to inconvenience you. I'm very sorry for this request. And now she is brave. She's on her heels. She's like, God damn it. What are you going to ask? What does this mean? What are you doing? And I go, I got to get a late checkout tomorrow. And of course, that's only a late checkout. I mean, of all the things and all the problems that could be thrown her way, late checkout, one of the easiest things to solve. So she goes, oh, okay. That's fine. Oh, okay. I thought it was going to be way worse. So I'm like, that's what I wanted you to think. You're crazy. You know, so, um, so then I go, I want to, she goes, what time do you want to check out? Do you want 12? Do you want one? And I go, well, my buddies aren't going to be in Boston until probably like 3 p.m. So I know that, you, you know, no hotel has ever done 3 p.m. checkout before. That's insane. But like as close to that as you could would really make, uh, make my stay more enjoyable. And she goes, how about a 3 p.m. checkout? And I go, 
Let's put it on the books, baby. And we high five. I go upstairs. I'm clicking my heels down the thing. I go go down into the steam room. They have a giant indoor pool and a steam room. I get a good steam going. I'm just trying to like enjoy. You know, I'm decompressing. Got a few hours for the show. I'm just trying to enjoy the steam room. And I get in this steam room and I can tell that there's somebody else in the steam room. I can't really see it. It's so steamy but I can see like the little pink hue of a body in the distance. So I'm just sitting there. We're both sitting in silence and we're just kind of breathing for a second. And then from the steam, I hear this dude go, what's going on? Just a 50 year old, like, hey, just this Boston dude. And the steam starts to like dissipate. It shuts off and this guy starts talking to me about who the fuck cares what. And then an old man, another old man comes in and sits down and they start talking about how to fix the economy and all the problems of society. And if only they were put in charge, they could figure it out. And uh, while they're all talking about it, the steam is dissipating and I see the what's going on guy. He's just, he has a towel on, but no, nothing else. And his towel is only wrapped around one of his legs and like the the head of his dick, like the shaft and his whole left leg is just, it's out for everybody. And he's just kind of talking about business while having half of a dick uh, 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 visible and the thing. And you're like, just put the towel on, wear a bathing suit, do something. But like, don't make one of us have to be like, hey, dude, by the way, half your dick's out. So go ahead and figure that out, you know, tuck that back in, do whatever you gotta do. I don't wanna see it, you know? And so I leave the steam room, cause I'm like, this is, you know, I don't know if I'm gonna be assaulted or something. So I leave the steam room, I go into my, into the pool where you have to reserve pool swimming times. It's a giant lap pool. And you're like, I, I got the four o'clock reservation. And so I'm in this lap pool, I go in there, I'm feeling good. I get like one, I get to, I swim one lap. I get one lap to the end of the pool and then I go to kick off the wall to really just, you know, just to fly underneath the water and I kick off and I, my heel kicks, I guess like a series of razors. I don't know what was in that pool, but it was the sharpest thing my body has ever come into contact with in my entire life and just, slices the heel of my foot into a million pieces, blood everywhere, bleeding all inside the pool. And I'm like, you know when you feel a cut cause like your skin is flapping in the water and I go, that's ah, not good. And I pick my foot out of the water and it's just like red, red wine. And uh, I am, I'm fucking like, uh oh. I, this, during COVID can't be bleeding in a, open bleeding in a pool. So I'm like, let me get out of the pool. So I get out of the pool. It looks like a scene from Jaws and uh, I get out of the pool. And now I'm like, I don't want people to be like, did that kid just bleed in the pool? Because now it's like, they're gonna, what are they gonna have to drain the pool? Like, I, I don't know what the protocol is. So my thing was like, I'm gonna wrap my foot in the towel and sit here for a little bit until the blood stops pouring out of my foot. And um, it took a long time. And the, and, and the, the towel couldn't be more filled with blood. I mean, it, was, it looked like a, a murder scene. Plus. Like it was a lot of blood on the towel and I'm just sitting there and now it's like 4.30 and like the next appointment's coming in and there's like children getting ready to swim in the pool. And I'm like, well, Nicole, what would you do if you were me? Would you have told them to like, by the way, I just like blood like a stuck pig in your pool, don't go in there. Or would you be like, it's a big pool, the blood will probably like dissipate and like the chemicals and the chlorine will counteract any sort of blood. No, I would have just left immediately I and not said a word. I, but I still would have probably been anxious knowing that my name was like in some system saying I was physically there at that time, so. This is true, yeah. Well, I, you're, you're a woman after my own heart because I didn't say anything. I just, I didn't say a goddamn thing. I watched those kids swim with open mouths and open eyes in the pool and I just said, I'm inside you now. And that is what caused more alarm. But I, uh, I, I, so I hobble with, I, I, I put enough pressure on it to where it stops bleeding for just enough time to get from the pool back into the lo uh, locker room. So I go back into the locker room. The blood is finally stopped. The, the towel, it literally, it looks like a crime scene uh, towel. So I need to hide that. And uh, they go, please drop your dirty towels off at the front desk. We don't do like dirty towels anymore. So now I have to hand them my blood rags. So 
I go, you know what, I'm gonna put it back in the thing. I'm gonna go back in the steam room now that the the what's going on guy is probably, hopefully can't still be in there. It's been 45 minutes. So I go to walk back and the guy is in the locker room area talking somebody else's ear off and he sees me and I hear him go, yeah, somebody else. Oh, that's the guy. Hey, what's going on, guy? And he's like, starts talking to me. Now he is completely naked, but he is holding the towel, like kind of like drying his dick, like, but holding it in a way. He's not like rubbing his dick in a sexual way, but like he's just too comfortable with nudity. And it's, uh, it was terrifying. And he was like, hey, did you turn the showers on? Cause they're, they're hot now. If, if you turned them on, cause somebody turned them on. And I'm like, not me. And he goes, oh, all right. Cause they're hot now. And I go, D okay, still not me, B goodbye. You know, and then I go back into the steam room by myself, bleed a little more. And then, uh, and then I get out of the thing and then I have to hide the blood towel. So I, I ended up putting it in like some like recycling bin somewhere. I essentially just put it in a place that like, Hopefully no one could find. And then I, I found another towel that was like clean and I returned that towel. So I really just hid the evidence of my blood rags. And uh, someone's going to think that someone had a period on my towel. It's going to be so bad when they find it. And I, it's going to be way worse than they, you know, it's not going to be as bad as whatever they conjure up in their head is going to be way worse, I guess. So then I got to do a show, you know, <laughs> then I have to headline a show. So I go, uh, I, I go and get a lobster roll real quick. How's that bad boy? Just a delicious, uh, incredible lobster roll. The point of this podcast is not to tell you things. It's to make you hungry. Have I made you hungry yet? <laughs> I tell you about a great corned beef sandwich and I make you queasy with the blood. And then I go back to the, uh, go back to lobster rolls. So I go to Laugh Boston. I have, it was a great show, by the way. So thank you everybody who came out. It was a nice little turnout for a, uh, for a Thursday when it was freezing during Omicron. I mean, it was, it was a great, it was a great day. We had Will Noonan and uh, Andrew Vickers open for me. Uh, Will Noonan, I'd known him for years on, um, on Twitter. Like we just knew each other from Twitter never met each other in person. So that was great. He came down, um, he opened it up, fucking killed it, did great. And like I said, it was a great turnout. Like I thought there was gonna be like 30 people there or something. There was like, I think just about 80 people there, which is pretty fucking great, like I said, for a Thursday. So I, I was pretty happy with that. And uh, we also had some podcast fans, which came out. Thank you very much for those of you who came up to me after the show and talked to talk to a, a few couples, actually, that were have listened to Irish Goodbye or Here's the Scenario or on the Patreon, which is so fucking cool of you guys. But if you were at the show, you know where I'm going with this. So I do the show and there's somebody I can hear the first two comics talking to somebody, you know? Like they're both addressing somebody in the crowd. And I'm like, what, what is this, what is this? And they go, oh, someone in the crowd just has a weird laugh. And I go, oh, okay, like I'll, I'll deal with that. I go on stage, um, there's a woman sitting in the second row who is a fan, so I, I'm, I'm treading lightly here, Nicole, but she's, uh, she had a, Laugh, it wasn't so much the, the quality of the laugh, it was the volume of the laugh and the length of the laugh. Uh, the volume was at, a, uh, was at a 10, and the length was 30 seconds longer than everybody else every single time. So it was one of those things where you have to, you know, you address it the first time, you know, and you call out, that's like a wild laugh you got there. You know, like you're laughing the right amount of time. These people are that kind of a thing. But you could see everybody in the general vicinity is very distracted. And now as it continues, as a comedian, we have a choice. Do we keep addressing it? Do we pause and wait until she is done laughing? Or do you try and talk over the laugh when you feel like you need to continue for the sake of the momentum. Well, I tried all three and uh, none of them worked perfectly, I'll be honest. Like sometimes I could see the momentum being like ruined or I could see that they, and you feel bad because the person, she's just trying to have a good time. You know, she's just having a fun time at the show. Turns out uh, she drove all the way from Long Island to Boston to come to this show, just for this show, just for me. So that's like one of those things where you're like, that's great, you know, like that's a great, you know, you're a great, you're a great fan, um, but 
it was a crazy like I feel like if you if you yourself have like a a wild laugh or a long laugh or maybe you're just like taking a bunch of Molly before a show, you got to sit like in the back, I think. You know what I mean? Just sit somewhere where people aren't going to where worst case scenario it takes a long time to travel to the front cuz people after the show were talking to me like, "What the fuck was that about?" as if I knew the person. You know, and I don't I don't know who she is, but she was, you know, she was very nice. But overall, the show was really really fun. And I had such a good time. And then I was going, uh, you know what? Like now I had a whole plan where I go, I'm going to go do a fucking like Anthony Bourdain, like sojourn across Boston. I'm going to go to some bars. I'm going to go to some old Irish bars by myself. Just fucking sit at the bar, listen to these people talk, just kind of be a fly on the wall of this society and get some culture. I was excited for it. Right. So I tell uh, the comedian Will Noon in my plan, and he goes, awesome, awesome, what bars are you going to? Because he's lived in Boston all his life. And I go, I'm not gonna go in here, go in here, go in here. And he goes, okay, so first one, don't go, you'll be stabbed. Uh, second one, never ever go anywhere near that part of town. So he basically was like telling me like, all the places I was going to were like, no, 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 no. So he goes, here's what we'll do. I'll come out with you, we'll go to a few bars together, and then there were other comics, there's a bunch of comics in the Boston area that came out uh, and just either like came to hang out at the show, which I thought was so cool. And I wrote, I think, a lot of their names down, so I'm gonna pull it up. But it was a cool thing to see like the the New York comedy scene, I mean, the Boston comedy scene, like, you know, they're a smaller scene, so they all like come out and support each other. Like, who's this guy from New York? They they heard about me or they heard about the podcast. So I wrote some comments out. It was uh, Monica was there, who also, again, it was uh, running the show The Canon was on, which was very nice. Uh, uh, Constantine. And then uh, a couple comics, both named, uh, both named Will. And so Will goes, I'm going to drive you back to your hotel to drop off all your shit. And then we'll go to the bar. Uh, and then they were all going to meet us at the bar. So I go, great. He drives me back to the hotel. He drops me off. It's a different entrance than I've ever been in before. Like, I, I don't remember. Like, I walked in the door. I couldn't. I had to, like, use my key card to get in. There was no reception desk. There was no front desk or concierge and I was like where I must be on the other side like a side entrance I'm on like some back of the hotel or wherever the fuck so there's an elevator bank right there like two feet into this side door that I've never been in and I go oh okay maybe this will bring me up to a different part of my floor I take the elevator up it ends up exactly where the elevators I were I, I took originally were it's like it's like right next to where my room is and I go well that's weird because elevators don't go sideways as far as I know so how the fuck did that happen but who cares? I put my shit down. I get changed. I, uh, I go to leave. I take those same elevators back down. Elevator doors open. I'm in the, uh, I'm in the main entrance. I'm in the, I'm in the reception desk, the concierge. It's the same. There's only three elevators and I, and they're all together. And I took the same elevators, ended up in a completely different place. So I go, oh, I'm sorry. I don't, I, I'm turned around. Where's the other um, where's the other entrance, the other side entrance? And the people at the front desk look at me and they go, there's no other entrances. And I go, well, yeah, no, no, there is. I just came through one. So like, where's the other, like in the side entrance or like the back, like, how do I get to that? And they go, I don't know what you're talking. There's no entrances. This is the only entrance. And I go, okay. I, now, now I'm at a point where I go like, I don't know why you're lying to me but I got to get out, you know? So I, I and it, by the way, now it's like whipping winds. It's three degrees outside. I'm not just going to walk around. This hotel is fucking huge. I'm not just going to walk around outside the whole perimeter. So I start walking around this hotel. I'm getting completely lost. I'm going up escalators. I'm going down staircases. I'm like in a basement. Then I'm six floors high. I'm texting Will going, dude, I'm in the fucking Shining Hotel. I don't know where I am. I don't know how to get out of here. This place is a goddamn, uh, it's a goddamn maze. And he's going like, we'll just ask somebody. So I saw another person and I go, oh, hey, where's the side entrance? And the guy just like cocks his head and looks at me as if I'm speaking a different language. And I walk away and he just follows me with his eyes until I get out of sight. I walk like seven football fields. It's been like 15, legitimately 15 minutes of walking around a hotel. Now I'm in a conference center. There's like office space. I don't, I don't know what's going on. I'm on a bridge like I don't know where I am and I'm losing my mind and I had that point where I'm almost gonna be like I'm going back to bed but I don't know how to even get back to bed so like I now I have to figure this out so I'm just texting I'm like dude this is crazy I can't believe it like I, I and I finally 
get down and I find, I'm, I'm walking, no lie, literally 15 minutes, I find a door, which isn't, by the way, is not the side entrance that I came in before. I like burst through this door. It's like a fire exit only door. I get out. I'm like not even on a path. There's just bushes. I'm literally bushwhacking. And I see the headlights of Will's car probably like 100 feet away. And I see the entrance where I went in. So I'm like, thank God that ordeal is over. So I'm, I am just m pushing myself through shrubs to get to this. I'm walking on like mulch and gravel and I start waving him down. Now I'm the guy on the deserted island trying to hail down a, a, a fucking plane. I'm going like this and I'm kind of playing it up because of how long it's taken me and the drama of the situation. Like I'm doing some of these, I'm like, <laughs> what the fuck is going on? You know, as I'm walking to the car and all that stuff. And again, all of it, all I see are his bright headlights. So I can't see him like reacting, but the car is, you know, running, whatever. So I get over to the car and I swing the door open and I'm like, what the fuck was that? There's no one in the car. There's no one in the car. It's just an empty car and the car is on and the car is running and it's an empty car. So now I'm like, what's going on? I am going to have a mental break. I start looking around. I'm going, well, well, it feels like I'm in a horror movie where someone's gonna come out and slit my throat. I am legitimately so confused. I go, where the fuck is Will? What psycho leaves his car on and running and unlocks? Somebody clearly murdered him and, and hit his body and now we're gonna get me and then steal the car and run away. So I am freaking out and I'm standing in, the, I don't even wanna get in his car because I'm like, is this not his car? Like then I was like, I'd only been in his car for two minutes ago. Is this not even the same car? Like where the fuck am I? I text him, I go, where are you? I'm, I'm at your car, you're not here, are you dead? And he goes, I'm at the reception desk looking for you. And I go, well, for the love of God, come back and it's gonna take you 20 more minutes to find how you got your way back. He comes out in a quarter of a second and he goes, uh, and he goes here's what's weird. So I'm laughing about this whole ordeal, right? He goes, you know, I went up to the reception desk and I said, uh, because I know you had just talked to them, and I go, did you just see uh, you know, that the, a guy walk by here. And they said, no one has walked by here in a long time. That's what they said to Will, who I just spoke to probably 15 minutes earlier. I spoke to these people. And then he goes, no, no, no. He goes, tall, skinny, white guy. And they go, oh yeah, yeah, he was just here. What the fuck is going on? What is with you people in Boston? Are you that much of, like, they're like, we don't snitch. That's just what it is. We ain't rats in here. Who'd you see? Well, I didn't see nothing. Tell them to go suck a lemon. Like, what are you, what are you doing? Like, I, I, I legitimately was so close to a mental break that I was about to just feel like I would never recover from that. I would never come back mentally. And for the rest of my life, I'd be totally fucked, um, which is crazy. It was a whole crazy thing, um, which is why, you guys should leave a five-star review because I almost had a mental breakdown and I hope that at least you enjoy that part of it. Uh, so leave a five-star review if you haven't. Tell a friend if you're in the live chat. What's up on Tuesdays? How are you doing? YouTube.com slash Mike Vinny Comedy. Watch this show. Nicole makes excellent graphics. It's worth the watch. I mean, we set up this whole camera. We do all this for a reason. Come watch it, baby. And uh, watch my special Rage Against the Routine. Follow me on Twitch, twitch.tv slash NY. Freshmaker. I'm streaming all the time. We're playing with Louis J. Gomez, Tim Butterly, Shuli Edgar, Brennan Sagalow. It's a goddamn blast, and you're going to love it. So come on there. Come hang out. We play most nights of the week. Follow me on social media at I am Mike Feeney to see when I'm doing that. And uh, come see me on the road, MikeFeeneyComedy.com for dates. And uh, you know what? Follow Nicole. If, you're, if you haven't followed Nicole by now, there's something wrong. And I don't know what it is, but you got to look deep within yourself and figure that out. Nicole, where can people find you? The something wrong is me, but my Instagram is Nicole C. Lyons, if Listen, you have any interest. It's a support system, all right? We're building a support system. Okay. So, also, Nicole, how crazy was that with the hotel, by the way? It is crazy. I was also thinking about The Shining. Like, it does feel like they were trying to kill you by telling Will, like, oh, no one's come by here in a long time. Yeah, I feel like it was one of those things where the guy was, like, creeping up behind me with the knife and he cocked it back right as Will opened the door so he had to, like, recede into the bushes or whatever the fuck. But it was, it was really insane. So now, because of that ordeal, it's, like, 11.15. It, it's, so, it's getting so late. We go down to this bar. 
and we're in Southie, and we go to this bar. I think it was L Street Tavern or something like that. And it's so funny because it coincidentally was the bar that they filmed in Goodwill Hunting. But it, to me, being in my first bar in Boston, it just looked like what I assumed every bar in Boston was, which is just memorabilia of Goodwill Hunting all over every square inch of the fucking bar. Like the tabletops, the walls, the bar, the back bar, the pictures of Ben Affleck, pictures of Matt Damon, like people like cheersing him, like them just being like, you know, Southie boys make good, win an Oscar. Like it, should, it was like the most hilarious frozen in time, exactly what you expect Boston bar to be. So we're there. I'm drinking some Guinness, hanging out with comics. We're talking shop. It's so fun to talk about, you know, to talk to comics and other comedy scenes because you forget like New York is kind of like, you know, it's kind of like the king of, of stand-up comedy scenes. So you don't expect like people in other scenes to know, like I don't know about the Boston comedy scene. I don't know about the Austin or Chicago comedy scene. I just know comics who live in New York who are from these places. But a lot of the Boston comics know about New York comics. They're like, oh, of course, like, we know about you. We've we've seen the special, or we you know we're gonna go see Canon tomorrow. Like it's just, it was a cool it was a cool vibe. So they're asking me about like what's this club like? What's this club like? It's very fun. And we're hanging out, and I'm like I'm just starting to I'm I'm finally I have my second beer. So I'm like now is we're gonna start to kick the night off. Now I'm like fully relaxed. Show's over. No more responsibilities for me. I'm just here to have fun officially on, in Boston. And twelve o'clock, they're like last call, and I go. Last call. It's 12 o'clock. Like, did we just talked about this with Mohegan Sun where they went to 3 a.m. and I was like, that's too late. Nobody should go to it shouldn't be past 2 a.m. But also it shouldn't be before 2 a.m. I mean, this is crazy. 12 a.m. I was like, are you fucking kidding? And literally, and they did the thing too where they kept coming over and being like, hey guys, we're looking to get out. So, you know, we're looking to go home. So, you know. And we're like, oh, okay. and we're like trying to drink our drinks faster and put on coats. And they're just sitting there. Every other table has all the stools up on it. And they're just staring at us, waiting to go home. So like, fuck. So, I mean, I'm literally back in my room by 1220, which is, I expected myself to, I don't know why I thought bars were open late in Boston. I expected myself to be out until 3 a.m. hammered. And I was I had a low buzz at 1215 and I'm back in my room. And I was like, I don't even know what I thought I was gonna do. I didn't have time. I don't know why I thought I had time to go to multiple bars. I go back to the room and I start watching that show Wipeout, which I think we've talked about on this podcast before, right, Nicole? I don't know about this podcast. Mm. Wipeout the show where they're like running through yeah. obstacle courses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I am, I gotta tell you, one of my most absolutely guilty pleasures. I love that show so much. I was sitting up in bed. Seal clapping. That's how happy I'm just ar, 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 just watching like a teacher from Biloxi get fucking blasted in her face. Like it was so it's so entertaining to me. I love it so much because it's like it's like jackass. It's like the show jackass because they're normal people. Like people watch American Ninja Warrior. Those people are like they train and they're in great shape. This is like an out of shape pasta maker who is like, you know, whose character is like, I'm the Fusilli King or whatever. The, you know, they have to have a stupid over the top character to get on the show and it's so corny and Nick Lachey's wife is like, huh? and then the two hosts are just fucking chode, like white guys who are like cruise ship comics or something, you know, whatever. So it's so bad, but I'm like, I I'm watching this going, am I a simpleton for loving this show? Like it is for sure like a low IQ show and I am having the time of my, I can't look away. I keep going like, oh, like right as it get blasted, I am, surprised and elated every single time. It was, I got embarrassed for myself while I was watching it alone. That's how, uh, that's how crazy it was. And I want to say this, and I've said this on Irish Goodbye. I, I might've said this on Here's a Scenario, and God damn it, I'll say it on every podcast I ever do. Someone, let's start a groundswell campaign, a grassroots, get me on that fucking show, all right? I want to do Wipeout, because I think I could win 
that show. I think I'm going to win $50,000. I think I'm good at the fucking thing. I'll come up with some character. I'll be like, I'm a bowling alley manager. I'm going to strike out the competition. You know, whatever. I'll come up with some lines. But we got to get me on that show because they just brought the show back. I actually filled out a form to apply to it in like 2014 or something like that. Didn't hear back, you know, bullshit. Um, but now I'm like, it's back with John Cena. I'm like, I think I could, I think I could fucking do it. And here was the really funny part. They always have like storylines, you know, because they have little characters on them. All the people they try and again, make these like boring average accountants try to have like, you know, whatever, some sort of big important story. So this storyline was that the final four people, three of them were women and one of them was this guy. And it became this like, the women versus the men. So all the women were like rooting for one another. And then when the guy would complete it, they'd just like look the other way and cold shoulder and stuff. And for a while you're watching this go and like, I see the way they're editing this. This is obviously like a men versus woman kind of a thing. Like women are just anything you could do, I could do better. Like women are completing the course too. Like this is all the other like out of shape fat guys have been eliminated. So now it's just these like strong women. And then this one like, average looking dude like not in any good shape whatsoever so it gets to the final thing which is like the final obstacle course for fifty thousand dollars it's down to one guy and one woman and um the woman goes first and she gets fucking launched out of the thing she's doing the obstacle course she's getting blasted in the face she's she falls down but she's like you know, she's really like making good time and they're commenting how she's like really like perfecting the course and rushing through it and like not taking any prisoners or wasting any time. And she's huffing and puffing, but she completes the course in, I think it was 10 minutes, like 10 minutes and like 25 seconds, whatever the fuck, 10 minutes end. And she completes the course and they're like, that's going to be a tough time to beat. Let's see if like Johnny, the who gives a fuck guy, you know, can possibly step up to this challenge. And... I mean, he <laughs> he got knocked down a few times back into the water, which when you get knocked down, you have to climb all the way back up. He completed the course in four minutes and 20 seconds. I mean, it wasn't even, it wasn't even close. Like it was such a moment of like, nobody was happy for this guy. This guy won $50,000 sleepwalking in through this course. It was so funny to be like this, like women, Men, no difference. And then it's like, oh, but when it comes to like upper arm strength, there's like actually like a pretty size. <laughs> it's like a, a pretty big difference in terms of like nature, you know, in terms of what men and women could physically accomplish on a show based on physical strength. It was so funny because zero people were happy for him when he won $50,000, which is, I think, supposed to be like a little unbiased. And they're like, it just ended with the credits coming on and they're like, yeah, I mean, men win again. Like, I, I you know, like, <laughs> and the woman was so crushed because she really thought she had done a good job, which she had, you know, for a woman. But 10 minutes compared to four. It was just, if you guys can go back and watch that episode, I don't even know what episode it was. It's the one where the woman loses. And it is just, it was real fun. It was just really fun to watch. Nicole, I'm going to pull that episode up for you at some point. Yeah, I'd love to see it. I really love shows like that, like American Ninja Warrior, especially because they build up the backstory of how much they've been training. And oh, like, yeah. They built an obstacle course in their backyard for thirty three thousand dollars. Yes. And like their whole family's falling apart and like someone has cancer. And then on like the yeah. first easiest course that like any human could do, they fall in the water. And yeah. It's so they're funny. like, I promised my my son who has leukemia that the money would go towards him. And if not, then we would just have to like let go, you know, and then it's like, yeah, he like trips over his own shoes, getting out of the gates and falls into the water. And then the kid just flatlines. Um, all right. Well, that was too, too dark. Uh, <laughs> so that's Thursday. You know, that's just Thursday. We're not going to get I'm not going to get to anything. There's so much here. This is crazy. I mean, this is I had I got uh, I mean, I want to talk about the fucking. All right. We'll do. I'll, I'll try to wrap this up quick. Um, Friday. I go, I take a lift, I go down to Southie, I go to this place, the Galley Diner, which I saw Bourdain had went to. This is probably like a 15 seat breakfast countertop spot and just the best, just the best. First of all, best corned beef hash I've ever had. I really filled up on corned beef related products uh, in Boston. And it was just this woman. First of all, I get in the lift, I wanna say. So there's a guy in the same room who goes, 
what's going on? I get in my Lyft driver, the guy's going, Mike. I, I feel like the city was fucking with me. You know, when someone talks to you like that, you're like, what? What are you doing? What do you fucking got planned? And so whatever. So I get there. There's this, there's this woman running the diner. She is probably 65, 70 years old. She has smoked every cigarette ever created twice. And she is just watching the news while like, you know, I'm one of two people in this entire place. She's just watching the news and every single time the a news puts up a story, she goes, and she looks at the television and then looks at the rest of us and go, have you ever heard of such a thing? She just like about whatever it was, like self-driving car. Have you ever heard of such a thing? And then all of a sudden they're like, they might find a cure for cancer. And she goes, would you look at that? Have you ever heard of such a thing? She just kept saying, it was like her catchphrase. It was unbelievable. So I get done with that. I go back to the room. I chill out because I got that 3 p.m. checkout, baby. Get another steam. I go to fucking, I check out of the hotel, 3 p.m. on the dot. The guy couldn't believe it. He's like, are you checking in? I go, no, I'm checking out. And he goes, checkout was at 12. And I go, <laughs> for some. And so I, uh, I go over, I go back over to where Mike and Nicole and Brendan are going to be. I go to Legal Seafood. I'm sitting there just having myself a gay old time. I'm eating oysters. I'm eating clam chowder. I'm washing that down with white wine. I'm reading a Hemingway book. Like I am just living my absolute best life. They're playing fancy music. It's like low lighting, a comfy booth. I'm having a great time. Mike's like, we're in traffic. I'm starving and pissed. Like it's just everybody they're 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 not having the day that I am having. Um, so, but what was weird was I go when the guy comes over and I was like, I'll get a glass of wine with some oysters. Cause literally I'm reading in this book about how Hemingway would have white wine with oysters. I'm like, Oh, that sounds fucking delicious. So then I was like, I'm gonna get that. So I go, I'm looking at the wine menu. I go, do you have anything? It's, it's two, it's two or 3 PM. And I go, do you have any sort of like happy hour? And the guy goes, there's, there's no such thing as happy hour in Massachusetts. And I go, what? And he goes, yeah. This is word for word what he said. He goes, too many Irish people were drinking and driving on their way home from work, so the state outlawed it. And it's like, first off, uh, why'd you single out the Irish? That seemed like a weird racial thing to do, to be like, yeah, these fucking Irish fucked it up for the rest of us, these goddamn mix. And you're like, why are you, why was, he said like, a, he like, he emphasized it. It was a hard Irish people, you know? And secondly, you think that, Two dollars taking two dollars off a drink is gonna stop us from drinking and driving. You got another thing coming, pal. All right, it's just gonna fucking. We're just gonna be angry when we're driving, you know. So, um, so that was crazy. I can't believe Massachusetts. You guys don't have happy hour. That's fucking insane. But whatever. And also in Boston, you're allowed to park on either side of the street in either direction. It's chaos. I've never seen anything like this. You have cars parked like. Bumper to fender to bumper to fender to fender to fender to bumper to bumper. It's it's it doesn't make any sense. I don't understand how it works or why it works like that. I meet up with Nicole and Cannon and Sagalo. We go do the show. The show is fun. Um, we have a good time. We're hanging out. I throw another lobster roll down. Then we come back. We get some. We find some mushrooms to take. We. And we talk about this on our Patreon episode of Here's a Snare, so I'm not going to go into as, as much detail, but we, we take the mushrooms, we go downstairs to the hotel bar, which is just in the hotel lobby, which is just directly outside of the automatic sliding door that lets 40 mile an hour gusts of freezing cold wind in. I am, uh, Nicole and I are drinking, and uh, Mike's manager, Chris, is he's drinking, right? I don't remember. I don't think he was. I don't actually know if he was drinking. But I had a few drinks in me from the bar already, so I'm feeling good. I take, I, we smoke, I take a little bit of the mushrooms, and I'm feeling like in a great place. You know what I mean? Like, I am, I am very, like, what would, how did we describe it yesterday, Nicole? I, I was, I was holding court. I, I was very sociable. I'm telling stories. I'm zipping and zopping. I'm fucking having a good time. And then, Slowly and surely, the mushrooms are starting to come on, so I'm starting to get louder in tone. I am laughing more at things that are being said. At one point, Mike and I have a crying laughing fit, and um, Nicole, thankfully, starts to let me know casually, quietly, respectfully, but also very hurtfully uh, that I am screaming because we start i at one point there was two dudes in a cowboy hat they both had cowboy hats come in and i just was like 
Look at these two just came off the prairie. You know, I'm just trying to fucking zing, zing, zing. And Nicole's just like screaming, screaming, top of your lungs, yelling so loud, so loud. And so that pretty much shattered every sort of confidence that I ever had. And then I was just ready to go to bed right afterwards. But Nicole, how was your perception of that night? <laughs> it was so funny. And I don't think we ended up talking about this on the Patreon episode. But do you remember that like family meeting that was behind us, like happening directly next to us? Or are you like a blank? Kind of. It was like very, was it very serious? Because it was making you legit cry for maybe like an hour <laughs> straight. It was like a, a woman who was like introducing someone to her family. Oh, yes, yes, yes. She was introducing them. Yeah, they were like, they were like doing like a nice to meet you. Yeah, it was like introducing her boyfriend. <laughs> What else about that? Wow, I remember you now that you said that. Because I was also laughing so hard because Mike was like, I'm scared to go to the bathroom and everyone's <laughs> yeah. like freaking out and you're screaming and like this beautiful touching family moment was happening was, like right yeah, behind was us. was attempting to happen while I'm like yelling about, I'm coming, look at that family over there introducing <laughs> themselves to one yeah. another. Boy, oh boy, they got another thing coming, you know, just screaming. And uh, eventually we were like, I think we got to we got to get out. So I am in such a great mood. I'm feeling euphoric. I'm like, let's go out. Let's explore. Mike and Brendan are like, I want to go to bed. Nicole's like, I'll leave you guys alone. You guys are weird. And uh, I'm like, let's go for a fucking walk and like look at some of the lights. There's a whole theater district over here. I convince everybody to go outside. We walk approximately 42 steps. Uh, I find a cool alley that is like, wouldn't you ever see an alley alley? Like like a, a cop show from the 70s alley where like if you run down it, it like ends with a brick wall and then you look at the rest of the alley. There's no garbage bales, there's nothing in this alley. And all of the places that would have been windows have been sealed with brick, but they still outlined the windows in like, what was that, paint or something? Did you come all the, you didn't really come all the way into the alley, I think, to see that. I think you guys got kind of freaked out. Brendan came in. I did walk in, but I was scared because it was pitch black. And I was like, I feel like this could turn everything if everyone goes For sure. Into this yeah. Alley. I mean, listen, it was, it was, it was a risk, but it was, uh, it was such a crazy, it was such a crazy thing to, uh, to witness. And then everyone's like, I want to go back in. And then for the rest of the trip, I was basically just a guy who wanted to like go out and do things. Mike and Brendan were in bed you know, like half asleep underneath the blankets for four hours. You miss nothing, Nicole. I was just, I was, I needed to be on some sort. I needed a drinker there with me. That's what I needed. I needed to be with a drinker, but I was with two stoned guys who were sleepy and wanted to go to bed. So it was not, it was not the, uh, the most fun, but I was, I still, it was a very euphoric time. Saturday I leave, I'm on the Excel back, still having a good time. The train breaks, the train in front of us breaks down. So they tell us a hundred people are about to come on to our train. So everybody like move all your shit. If you're not sitting next to somebody, you're about to, sorry about this. So I, maybe dickfully, maybe respectfully, maybe shrewdly, definitely not respectfully, I move from the window seat to my aisle seat and I put like one or two articles on the window seat, like the woman did on the way there. And I just start looking like the busiest man on the planet. I mean, I am just head in hand. I'm throwing this up every once in a while. I'm fucking scratching at this paper. I'm like, I'm, I'm you know, pretending like I'm doing taxes. I got a little green hat on with those lights. And uh, I am, there's people coming on it. Every seat around me is getting filled. And I'm like willing to easily move if someone asks. No one asked. I got up about an hour later to go to the bathroom. The entire train car was filled. I am the only person in the entire car that didn't have somebody sitting next to them. Now, Nicole, was that a dick move or is that just kind of fucking, that's how you play the game of life? That is certainly how you play the game. I do the same thing. I put all my stuff on the seat and pretend I'm asleep. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that was Boston, everybody. And I think that was pretty much the entire episode. Are we at an hour? Exactly an hour. Exactly an hour. Well, here's the thing. I got to talk. I'm, I'm going to talk about one thing that's current because it won't be current by the next time we record. So I got to. Oh, there's so many things. I should have done this earlier, Nicole. There's not enough time. Um, I got to say. This this West Elm Caleb thing, uh, you said you've heard about it, but you're not too sure what the story is, right? Yeah, I understand like the general idea of it, but I don't know nearly enough. So there were two two things that made me insane uh, to the, this and that I've read in the news. Number one, West Elm Caleb. So there's this guy, and you can pull up this article, that BuzzFeed article, Nicole, and just go down to like 
the accusation points, I guess. So he's a he's a 25 year old kid that kind of got like virally doxxed on TikTok because people started talking about bad dating experience. They mentioned this kid, Caleb, who works at West Elm and he they they got ghosted by him. And then a bunch of other people like I got ghosted by him, too. And then it became this entire thing. And uh, what can you read some of the accusations? Yeah, some of these are truly insane. Yeah. Number one, as mentioned, he ghosted people. Which sounds to me like a 25-year-old on a dating app. I mean, what? All right. That's pretty acceptable in this be in this in this time. Didn't we just recently talk about how ghosting is now like almost acceptable because to break up with somebody in person seems rude? I mean, it's like anyway, um, what's next? Number two, he allegedly sent at least one person an unsolicited nude photo. All right. I mean, listen, throwing a dick pic out there. Hail Mary. Got to take a shot. I've never done it. But again, I feel like. uh, What is it? I'd probably say six out of every 10 men will do that on the dating apps. Do you think that's too high or not high enough? Not high enough. Not high enough. All right. So again, 25 year old. Go ahead. Uh, number three, he recycled the same Spotify playlist and claimed he had made it just for them. Oh, okay. So a genius move. Is that what you're saying? He had a guaranteed workable fuck playlist that women wooed were wooed by. And they're upset that they thought the playlist was only for them. Listen, if you got a good mixtape, you recycle the mixtape. That's what you do because it's a bulletproof mixtape. Anyway, nuts next. This one's very concerning. He'd love bomb or show a ton of initial interest over text. Love bombing is regarded as a precursor to abuse. Now, sounds to me like he was trying to get puss. Uh, That's what it's, I mean, I ain't no physicist, but that sounds like someone trying to get the puss. Like, that's what you do. He came on strong in the beginning until he slept with me, and then he ghosted me. Oh, so you gave up the puss, so he got the puss, didn't need it anymore. And he left. Because why? 25. So that, to me, sounds crazy. So they, And then they tried to label this as love bombing, where they're like, it's a love bomb. This is what happens. They show you a lot of affection, a lot of attention, and then they start beating you. But can you read the next sentence of that love bombing thing? Sure. There were never any accusations of abusive behavior. He just ghosted. Oh, okay. So <laughs> not at all what you said. Maybe trying to get puss and maybe that's what he did and that's why so here's why i'm putting him on the leave that person alone caleb fucking what the dude's a 25 year old who barely has such good game he's enough to woo so many women that he could go viral and get laid with his playlist making ability and his love bombing techniques without the abuse by the way so important without the abuse just ghosted them and all of these women are heartbroken and pissed. And by the way, and I don't mean to be this guy, but if the roles were reversed and there was a man, if there were men making all of these videos, doxing a woman for ghosting them, they would be called incels. They would be arrested for doxing. People would line them up in front of a firing squad and then they would dox them as well. It's crazy that because it's like, well, we're women, we're a victim. And, you know, and I understand there are many, many, many men who are pieces of shit out there. But you're like, this dude, tell me, uh, find me another 25 year old single kid that isn't doing this exact thing, but maybe less successfully. And I'll show you somebody who's not West Elm Caleb, you know? So that's fucking... That's it. I just wanted to talk about that. West Elm Caleb, leave that person alone. That's the show, everybody. I got so much more to talk about. I'll talk about on next week's episode. We got to get into that fucking smoothie psycho, the Neil Young, Joe Rogan stuff. I mean, all of this shit is crazy. So thank you guys very much for watching the show. I appreciate it. Um, Please, again, tell some friends about the show. And until next week, cheers. Have yourself a good weekend. Good weekend. The show comes out on Tuesday.